I have a special guest here today. I'm sure that you know him by name, by face, by newspaper, by all kinds of community uh, outlets right here where we live in Wenatchee. I'm talking with Rufus Woods today. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, Lisa, what a thrill to be on your show. I'm just a big fan of the work that you're doing and how you're making a difference in the community and the world. So uh, I couldn't be couldn't be happier to be here. So any of you, anytime you call, I'm I'm happy to help. Well, thank you. You know, I think about you a lot and through your you have your own podcast show, Art of Community, and then you still write a column for the Wenatchee World. Uh, but for those of us who might not know all of the details of uh, your life. We only have 24 minutes, but you do come from the family that founded the Wenatchee World. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that, because when I reached out to you, you've been posting old relics you found from your father and your grandfather. And so let's just talk about the history of the people you come from. So people know that that birth order, if nothing else. Yeah. So my grandfather moved here in uh, 1904. He he was a Nebraska boy and had gone to law school and he had a three month law practice in Seattle and decided that wasn't for him, uh, came to Wenatchee um, and then he ended up uh, working for the newspaper here. And a few years later, he and his uh, uh, twin brother bought it, uh, Rufus and Ralph. And they um, and that that uh, became his you know, great uh, platform for uh, building community. And so my grandfather, Rufus, who I'm named after, um, it was spent uh, his time, his biggest, um, uh, his biggest, um, I guess, claim to fame was that uh, he was one of the four guys who got Grand Coulee Dam built. So he uh, wrote the first story proposing the dam uh, back in 1918, and that became his lifelong pursuit. And so, um, to honor him after after he passed away, the uh, Congress named the body of water between Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dam, uh, Lake Rufus Wood. So, so he was a massive promoter. He was a character. He joined the circus when later in life and as a clown. And he was a big, big character. Traveled the world, um, knew everyone. Um, and then um, after he died in 1950, he ran it from 1907 to 1950. Um, uh, then uh, dad ran it till 97 and then, uh, turned it over to me. So, um, so yeah, so long and dad was uh, in his right, um, you know, all about, um, resource development, all about community, the arts, um, kind of helping the community succeed. And, and that was really the history that uh, was passed on to me was just make, make the place better. Um, and, uh, and they, they live those values and, uh, I try to do, try to follow in those, those footsteps. Well, and I think also when I think here, you talk about something community was taught to you from a very young age. And obviously there's some of um, people watching and people who weren't raised that way, who weren't taught to think about community. And yet I'm a true believer in us taking care of our little corner of the world. If everyone took care of their corner of the world, obviously the world would be a better place. And so uh, the irony is that, you know, the Wenatchee world is the, the name and you, your family most definitely has been taking care of this little corner of the world for a long time. Was there any, was there any time growing up that you felt a pressure to contribute or was it just so ingrained in you that it was an honor to contribute? No, never any pressure. Just, um, I mean, that was just, the the way, I mean, my, my dad was involved in, um, and, and um, so many civic efforts and various projects at trying to, again, make the place better. And it just, I mean, it just that, 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 you know, you, what you're familiar with that you tend to, it tends to sort of get in your DNA and your blood. And uh, so got, I came to love, love um, uh, the newspaper, love to write, loved the, the people who were here, just a lot of amazing folks that uh, that worked really hard and and uh, also played hard and had a lot of fun and uh, uh, but also with the with the eye towards you know how do we how do we make things uh, make things better for the long term and so uh, I mean that just came kind of naturally and then over I didn't really think about it at the time but it's just over time it just made more and more sense to me that uh, to try to do my my part to try to you know continue that uh, 
that tradition. So I feel I feel very fortunate because uh, I had amazing role models and my mom and grandmother and and grandmothers and uh, you know everybody um, uh, in my family has been been super uh, involved in that way. Speaking of writing, you said you love to write. Obviously, we know this about you, and you're a good writer. Whose typewriter is that back there? That was my grandfather's typewriter, or my grandfather, my dad's typewriter. And so he would he would plunk out his columns in here, even into the computer age for a while. Then he switched to computers, but you'd hear him. I mean, that's why I grew up uh, when I st first started a, as a reporter. I would, we were typing on typewriters and sending it down to the composing room. And this was all hot metal days and back in the back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And so that was how we that was that was the experience. And so um, that's but that's dad's good dads. And so um, my uh, my my uh, uh, my my I keep that in a special place. So yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun. I received my first typewriter for Christmas when I was eight years old, and it was after seeing the film, uh, after I saw Rocky II. Mm -hmm. I begged right. for it. And what I loved about it is it had corrective ribbon, yeah. and so I could make a mistake and keep going. Uh, however, I learned, I don't know about you, if you played around on the typewriters when you were young, I, I to this day don't know how to properly type because I picked up all the habits of improperly typing from a young age. I tried to take a typing class in high school and I just, I couldn't change my ways. Didn't, didn't take, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, I, I became a really fast typist and, and uh, of course my brain goes um, of uh, various directions a lot of, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and is always uh, going. So uh, I think my, my, my typing uh, follows that it's kind of all, all at once. And yeah. so uh, that's, that's what, what, it, what it works well. That's, what, that's how it happens. I'm a huge believer in holding on to the things I write, even if I think they're not that good. Um, because when I revisit it a couple of weeks later or whatever the case might be, uh, usually there's some stuff that, that sticks. Do you, do you have a process that's changed over the years? Have you kind of always done things the same way? How do you go about your writing process? I really, I've, I really changed to try to, I used to think of, think a lot about trying to write, um, uh, well, you know, um, uh, form over substance. And I've, I've really shifted over time to, to, I really focus on what's the heart of the story? What's, am I, am I capturing what this, this individual or this circumstance or these people are trying to say? Have I captured what, and so that's really the, the standard. I don't worry so much about form. I don't think my, I'm sure my, my, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, the, uh, the most eloquent or elegant of writers, um, but I, I just, what I really kind of try to try to capture is the, um, the spirit, the passion, the momentum, the, you know, the, the, just the, the purpose that's, that's behind what people are doing. I, I find that to be the most interesting thing is what, why people, why people are, uh, I was interviewing Otto Ross, uh, just the other day, he's a 96 year old, still teaching skiing, 70 years of teaching skiing. And, you know, just the passion of, of, of at 96, still going to Mission Ridge two days a week. And uh, that, that stuff gets, I mean, that's, that, that turns my crank quite a bit. And, it's and pretty it's, hard to mess that up. Right. I mean, the yeah, story's you, there. <laughs> yeah. You just, you, you don't want to mess those things up. And so I think it's, it's, but it's, it's finding or the attempt to try to find out what, what what powers people what motivates them what inspires them you know uh, much like the work you do what what is what is their community con contribute contribution spirit and how is that you know how are they expressing that and and uh, so that's that's uh, you know and when it works well um, sometimes I can feed back to them something that they didn't really hadn't articulated that's that's when um, that's sort of the um, a uh, wonderful moment that once in a while happens. Not very often, but once in a while. Yeah, I always say that um, if I'm interviewing someone and they say, that's a really good question, mm -hmm. then I can kind of relax and I think, okay, well, I've asked them something they haven't been asked before. Because sometimes, you know, when you're interviewing someone who's got sound bites, they've got their story, di story dialed in and they don't think that there's anything new they can say, it's always my goal to hopefully use some life experience and just having been a storyteller like you for so many years, um, you're much more of a veteran at it than me. I'm just 
getting started sort of um, to be able to ask somebody something they haven't heard a hundred times before is, is really a privilege in storytelling. Yeah, it is. And the, 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 we are built for story. It, it is what is, it is the narrative of our lives, the narrative of our community's lives, you know, and everybody has, everybody has a story there. Everybody's got amazing things to contribute. They don't think they do, but, but they don't every, sometimes, they, right? Right. It's like, oh no, I was never me, right? But and uh, those are the people who almost <laughs> you can't get them to stop talking. Sometimes it's good stuff. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about how the news has changed, just how we receive and disseminate the news. We're talking with Rufus Woods. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back. I'm talking with local Rufus Woods. You know him from the Wenatchee World and Art of Community podcast. Thanks again for being here. I want to talk about, I, I saw some posts of you sharing uh, old uh, postcards and uh, newspapers and all the things from your father and grandfather's archives. And let's talk about the way that we receive and disseminate news today. I worked for a college newspaper, or I worked for a newspaper when I was in college, and back then, that would have been about 1994 or so. And um, we had to still type things out and then tape them down on the lined paper. And that's how they went to print. Um, within just a couple of years, it was, you know, we were able to put them in. But there was so much that, you know, if you had this all cut perfectly and then you found a misspelled word or, somebody wanted to add a quote or we got something wrong. It was quite the thing because there was just a certain amount of space. And that wasn't even the, the, the plates that you're talking about. So let's talk about the history of how we create and receive news and the importance of getting it right. And I'm just sometimes appalled when I read online credible papers and there's mistakes everywhere because everybody's trying to be first. Well, I think it's it's a couple of things. It's everything. Everyone's trying to be first, but also there's a a natural piece, which is that um, um, the economics have changed, and and so um, it, when when the economics changed, it you you don't have the staff for proofreaders that we, like we used to have. So we were hot, you mentioned hot metal production. So we would melt the paper down every night, but believe it or not, and and we would and and we re we build it line by line the guys would sit there at line type machines or it later would be fed in via ticker tape um these stories um uh and and it would and 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 so it would create the paper like in metal every day it's just it's almost strange just to look at that it's a great there's a uh, you know it, it was a tremendous complex and process and so um and so i think that uh, obviously that was a, a different time and then you're right we went to uh offset printing offset printing which you know and then we we're pasting up and doing the same things cutting and pasting and hopefully you get your 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 didn't get your hands crossed and and uh, um and so i think that the uh it is and then of course now digitally you can everything's produced digitally it's seamless um, you know, that was the promise back in the day, uh, but it, everything has so, happened so fast and so immediately right now in everything we do. Um, and I think that's, that's really changed. Um, I changed our society changed. Uh, and so we, you know, um, we used to see a lot more things vetted than, than we do now. I think the, the, the traditional, the newspaper still does, tries to do its, its very best to try to you know, uh, uh, to, um, you know, make sure everything's correct. And, but, you know, it's a, uh, there's a time pressure and, and also so much to cover. And again, the economics have changed with Craigslist that came along and with the whole advertising model blowing up um, and changing, it's just become a much more challenging, uh, you know, business. And it's, it, it shows, um, but that core purpose of, of reflecting what the community is doing and trying to tap into the community and and to tell a bit of the narrative story of the community that hasn't changed. I think one of the things that I'm proud of is that you know we I think we tried to over time just be uh, be there for the community, not just 
here's what's wrong in the community, but here's the there are things that, that are going right. And I think that's a that's a key responsibility that oftentimes uh, may get short shrift. Uh, I think our local media here does a fabulous job of of telling the the positive stories that about what's working. Um, and I think that's essential for the, the the maintenance of a community, a sense of community, is we have a, sh a certain shared experience. And, and people from you know all perspectives, all walks of life, all life experiences kind of have a common framework. And more challenging these days in, in the days of social media that kind of tend to divide and, 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 and allow us to go into our own little silos. But, um, but I think that's, that's a really important part of local media to the extent that we can do that. That's, that's, that's community affirming rather than community destroying. One of the thing I have to, I'm someone who can't or chooses not to watch the news. Usually I prefer to read it. Even if I read a summation of a newscast, I need to be in a little more control of what comes through my, my brain and my soul and my, my spirit, my body. Like I have to, I have to really be diligent about that because I'm someone who will hold on to some of the things that, that make it hard. I've been that way since I was a kid, you know, when they would come through with a special report and interrupt programming, I thought we were going to war. You know, I thought the worst thing was going to happen. And so um, these times, especially I take my time and I, I try to read all different sources. Uh, I don't bury my head, but I choose when and, and how much. I think that's really wise. And I think more people need to apply that. It's just so easy to go, go into and, and, uh, and get fed this on the 24 hour news cycle, or I think, I think you have to filter that. You have to, I think, and I do the same thing. I, I really try to take a, a, a particular on the political perspective. I look, I look at all different angles of that. I can find great value in, in, in all perspectives. And I don't think any one perspective has all the answers or the entire truth. And I think having that, uh, the discipline to do that and figuring out Okay, where do I stand there? What, how do I, how am I processing all this? Really important um, discipline that I think we need to continue to try to try to encourage people to, to to think again, think you know twice, to keep an open mind, and maybe not just accept the sort of the the, the you know if uh, a one side of the, the sort of binary, it's all this or it's all that that ain't life and it isn't uh, life at all no it isn't life it, at all and it's and it's destructive it's 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 only destructive um and i think that's where you know um trying again trying to keep it up mind and then and then that's where being a good listener and 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 trying to try to find value in whatever perspective because there's great value in different perspectives we just have to be disciplined enough to, to do that so I, I applaud you for that well, let's take a break and we finish up. Let's talk specifically about a few of your favorite stories, shall we? It's okay. like choosing a favorite kid, which I can't do. I only have one <laughs> kid, but uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the storytelling that's enriched your life as well as the communities. We'll be back. We're talking with Rufus Woods. We're talking with Rufus Woods. I could talk to you for an hour or two but we only have a few like five minutes left. So I want to hear about some of the stories that have impacted you and enriched your life as you share them with our community. I mean, every, the, the next story is always the most interesting one, right? I mentioned Otto Ross, um, the, op the opportunity is to, to, to get to know him a little bit better. He and my dad skied for years and were great, good friends and traveled together and skied. Um, and just the, 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 the amount of time he invested, there was a young woman here, Pat, uh, it's now Pat Turner, was Pat West at the time in, in high school, lost a leg, and then in, in a car, terrible car accident, he taught her to ski with outriggers. She went on to national and international competitions. I uh, still see her down here at Pibus occasionally. You know, those, I mean, every every story is like that. Or the, the young man who, uh, the, uh, the 11-year-old who's, uh, his name is Fussamos. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, he, he was playing baseball, and he's just so passionate. And his and 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 that story of 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 hitting the home run and, and the whole and then contributing back, you know, going back and 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 um, and and um, umpiring for younger kids' games and and the 
but working with special needs kids in, in Eastmont Bambino program, you know, that, that, that thing of where it's not just about me and what I did, but, but, but contributing. And, you know, I think philosophically, that's one of the things that really shifted my thinking was just uh, getting um, acquainted with appreciative inquiry, what's possible rather than what is wrong. And I think mostly, um, or uh, not mostly, but a lot of our society and a lot of media is driven off of what's wrong. Plane lands at Pangborn, it's not news. If it crashes, it is. And, and yet there's so much um, that is amazing that that isn't what's wrong. It's all about what's, you know, uh, uh, tapping into the stories and that's the, yeah. that's the job that you do as well and, yeah. and and i think the more of us that tell those stories the, the better off we are so that's that that philosophically when i changed and I, that that really changed the way i looked at my own work how can how can i be maximum uh, of maximum value to the community um and storytelling is what i i where, where I, I feel like i can do that that's one of the things too. I just got back from the Don't Wait Project tour and traveling, and I'm always in search of the story that speaks, yeah. you know, that I, if I tell a variety of stories, if I help tell a variety of stories, there will be someone who's following along on the tour, it will, they'll find their story, you know, because we're not going to all relate to all things. But I think if we're making an effort to try and show representation of a number of different people and the different plights of life and teaching empathy through storytelling, you know, I wouldn't want anyone to go through the things that I've been through to hopefully, hopefully glean a lesson about what's important and to not wait to do the things that are important. And then certainly there are things that I can learn from other people that I have not yet experienced. And I think that's the beauty of storytelling. And then those gems, like the 11 year old boy, I could so see my son in so much of that story. And so that was a story that I related to. Maybe the next one I wouldn't, but there's always something in there for, for other people. So that's the goal. Yeah, Wyatt Delosier, wonderful kid and just a gem. And and I think, I mean, it, it really, it, that, that's exactly why we do this work, right? And I think trying to find ways to help people see it from a different, maybe a different perspective. I hadn't thought about this, you know, or how, look at it, try to again, put people in other people's shoes to the extent you can. And just at least with that intention to get people to think um, and and just treat each other kindly, because you know the 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 the, the wisdom of um, be nice to people, be kind, because people people have had a hard journey, and you don't know where they've come from, what they've been through, and and I think the more grace we can give, and I think you do you definitely do that with your work, the more grace we can give, the more we can you know, reserve judgment instead uh, and, and, and show some kindness that, that I, I think, that, I mean, I think that, that revolves, I think that spins for plays, pays forward. And, and, and that's what makes the community and, and, and the world better. Well, thank you so much for being here, Rufus. I've enjoyed talking with you. We'll do this again sometime. Like Anything. I said, I should do an hour special just talking with you. <laughs> I love talking with you, Lisa. Love what you're doing and just thank a, you. A, a best, best to you. Thank you so much. Take good care. You too. The agents of Kennedy Real Estate Group are committed to providing the ideal client experience. We believe in the power of relationships. Why? Because we don't just work here, we live here. From the nonprofits we serve, the parks where we play, and the local businesses we support, our team understands the value of living in the Wenatchee Valley. Let's begin your real estate story. Hi, I'm Brent Crowder, sales manager at Town Toyota. When you're working with us, you're working with people who love and raise their families from generation to generation, right here in the Wenatchee Valley. Our sales team has more than 150 years combined experience and we know our product. Town Toyota runs a top ranking service department in our region, staffed with certified Toyota technicians, offering monthly promotions for our customers. We're here for the life of your vehicle. Come see us today.